So welcome back to our continuing discussion of psychology. Today we are going to be continuing with unit one, but moving on to module two, which is focused on psychology's history and approaches. Our learning targets for this module, module two, are to be able to describe how contemporary psychology focuses on cognition, biology and experience, culture and gender, and human flourishing. Also to be able to really understand what is known as the biopsychosocial bio approach, uh, which is a very important thing to understand as we move forward in our study of psychology. And to be able to explain how psychological principles can really help you within this class, within all your classes, and within uh, your studying for the AP psychology exam if you decide to do so. So let's back up a little bit and talk about what is psychology. Well, psychology is the scientific study. See that bolded? Scientific study of the behavior and mental processes of humans and other animals. Some psychologists work primarily with other animals. Most do work with humans, but it is important to keep in mind that a lot of psychological research has been done in the past and still is done with other animals. So why is psychology scientific? Well, is it scientific because we study the brain? Well, partially, but that isn't the main reason it's scientific. It is scientific because we use empiricism. We utilize the scientific method. We think about things critically. We evaluate evidence. We need evidence. So when we're talking about psychology and behavior, what is that definition of, that operational definition of behavior? So psychology examines behavior, which consists of any observable and measurable action taken by a person or other animal. So anything a person or animal does is considered a behavior. Now on the other hand, what are mental processes? So psychology examines mental processes, which consist of the internal subjective experiences that are inferred from that behavior, from said behavior. So sensations, perceptions, dreams, thoughts, beliefs, and feelings are thought of as mental processes. So in general, psychology is really growing and globalizing. Contemporary psychology is influenced by biology, our nature, and experience, our nurture, culture, is very important as we're studying psychology and gender. And this whole idea that we need to be really looking at the idea of human flourishing is also abounding within the growth of psychology. So how does contemporary psychology focus on cognition, biology, and experience? Well, in other classes, or even in our previous module, you may have heard a mention of the nature versus nurture issue. And this is a really important issue throughout every, every um, class you'll ever take, within, especially this one, within the field of psychology. So basically that question is, is whatever we're seeing, whatever behavior is manifesting, or whatever mental process we're studying, is it due more to genes or is it due more to experiences? And I'm going to give you a little clue. Most things are some sort of combination of both. Within um, studies of things like intelligence or personality, we do see quite a, a fairly strong genetic um, influence, but we also see experience as a big factor in a lot of those as well. So environmental issues also play a large part. Contemporary psychology recognizes the importance of both nature and nurture, nurture, as well as how they interact with each other. So what is nature? Behaviors and mental processes occur because they are born or innate. That's the idea of what's nature. It's part of your nature. You have that personality you have because you were born with it and that's part of your nature. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that, but it's not just nature. I will learn later on when we study uh, personality in depth. So some famous people, in history who had held more of a perspective that things were due to nature were Socrates and Plato, Rene Descartes, and Charles Darwin. Now what is nurture? So nurture are behaviors and mental processes occur as a result of experience or the environment. So basically the idea of John Locke was you're born as a blank slate and all of your experiences help shape you into who you are. Aristotle also believed this. And this is sort of how the behaviorist came to be. They took a lot of this idea about nurture being so important and thought that they could shape um, individuals into whatever they thought uh, they should be. So Charles Darwin and nature versus nurture. I'm sure you guys have heard of Charles Darwin and his famous 
um, research in, on the theory of evolution, he argued for nature in his very famous book on the origin of, spe of species. To him, traits and behaviors that provide a survival or reproductive advantage are naturally selected. So if there's something that um, is really adaptive for a particular species, it will be selected for um, over time, and you'll see more of that particular trait. So how does contemporary psychology focus on biology and experience? So it's in different ways. So evolutionary psychology um, is, is a current field of study, and it's the study of how behaviors and mental processes present in the species today exist because they were naturally selected in the way that Charles Darwin described. There's also the concept of behavior genetics, the study of the relative influence and limits of genetic or nature and environmental or nurture influences on behavior and mental processes. One way that psychologists study um, the influence of nurture versus nature, nature versus nurture, is twin studies, which are fascinating. We're going to talk about them a lot throughout this course, and um, it's just really a, a fascinating way to look at what different um, psychological characteristics are due more, seem to be due more to nature versus nurture. So with twin studies, we have to remember some things. Identical twins, also known as monozygotic twins, share 100% of the same genetics. Whereas fraternal, like your brother or sister that is not your, um, your identical twin, share 50% of the same genes. Twin studies provide evidence for the relative influence of nature and nurture and are used in behavior genetics. So moving away from the nature aspect of things a little, how does contemporary psychology focus on culture? Well, what is culture? Culture is the shared ideas, values, behaviors, and traditions shared by a group of people, and it's often passed down from one generation to the next. Culture impacts perception of time and promptness, ideal personal space, beliefs about marriage and sex, and emotional display. So certain really interesting things. Um, how does the culture we are from impact certain things. And one example is kissing. This is a really fascinating, odd example, actually. Um, in cultures with languages that read from left to right, about two thirds of couples lean their heads to the right from kissing. How does the culture, um, how about in cultures that read from right to left? Well, they tilt their heads the other direction. So how does contemporary psychology focus on gender? Well, gender is a socially constructed role and characteristic by which a culture defines male or female. So reported gender differences are how emotions are expressed or detected, what we dream, risk for certain psychological disorders. Biological similarities, age of first steps, how we remember and forget, overall intelligence and well-being. How does contemporary psychology focus on biology and experience? So sorry about that, had a little bit of a glitch. Um, how does contemporary psychology focus on biology and experience? So there are some shared biological processes that seem to guide behavior across cultures. Things like individuals with specific learning disorder, um, specific learning disabilities it's also called, and in the area of reading this has also been known as dyslexia. People with dyslexia have shown the same brain sort of issue across diverse cultures. Um, if you're interested in this subject, a really uh, fascinating book I read, and it's probably a little bit dated, I don't know if there's a newer version of it, but Sally Shaywitz's book, Overcoming Dyslexia, has some really interesting information on um, the, the areas of uh, the brain within individuals with dyslexia, how they are different in terms of functional magnetic resonance imaging, and how with really good interventions in reading, those can actually change. So all human, another one is all human languages share the same deep principles of grammar and nonverbal communication of basic emotions is pretty universal. So like the messages of a smile kind of mean the same thing across cultures. How does contemporary psychology focus on human flourishing? Well, with positive psychology, um, which is the scientific study of human flourishing, the goal of discovering and promoting human strengths and virtues the strengthening of individuals and communities. Um, at, at the University of California at Berkeley, they have a real
the Greater Good Institute, I believe is what it's called, and it has a whole lot about studying positive psychology in the scientific study of human flourishing. The main purpose of positive psychology is to measure, understand, and then build the human strength and virtues. This is, was said by Martin Seligman, who's a famous uh, contemporary psychologist who has studied a lot about depression and things like that. So I mentioned earlier that the biopsychosocial approach is something that you should really understand as we move forward within the field of psychology. And what does that mean, that biopsychosocial approach? Well, it's understanding behavior or mental processes from three key viewpoints, which are um, the behavioral perspective, how learned and observable behaviors impact behavior and mental processes, the biological perspective, how biological, such as genetics, neural, hormonal, and physiological processes impact behavior and mental processes. So you can see those are kind of the nature versus nurture. And then also cognitive. So how interpretation, so it's beyond just um, the biological and the behavioral environmental, it's our interpretations of situations and mental processes, our thoughts, memories, problem solving, how do those impact behavior and mental processes? So how does contemporary psychology focus on cognition, this idea of uh, our thought? So what is cognitive psychology in general? First of all, let's back up a little. It's the study of mental processing, the thinking, perceiving, learning, remembering, communicating, and solving problems. Now we hear a lot about neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience, but how is that related to psychology? Is it a part of psychology? And yes, it is. Um, and it's sort of an outgrowth of the idea of cognitive psychology. Cognitive neuroscience is the interdisciplinary study of the brain activity linked with cognition, including perception, thinking, memory, and language. So what are psychology's evolution, evolutionary and humanistic perspectives? Well, the evolutionary perspective is how the natural selection of traits has promoted the survival of genes, as we mentioned uh, several slides ago about Charles Darwin's ideas. The humanistic perspective, if you remember in module one, we talked about Carl Rogers a little, little, and another famous humanistic psychologist is Abraham Maslow. And what they were interested in was how the drive for personal growth and self-actualization impact behavior and mental processes. And this is still what humanistic, the humanistic perspective, even in modern psychology. So how about psychodynamic? And when you hear the word psychodynamic, you should immediately be going to thinking about Sigmund Freud and sort of what, you know, whereas a lot of Freudian ideas have sort of, um, we've learned that they don't sort of hold up to, testable, to be testable over time, we've learned that. There was a large growth of um, the psychodynamic dynamic perspective, and it's changed and evolved into something that's a more contemporary approach toward the psychodynamic perspective. So basically looking at how unconscious drives and conflicts impact behavior and mental processes, whereas the social cultural perspective looks at how behavior and thinking vary across situations and cultures. So shifting gears a little bit, how can psychological principles, so how can psychology help me right now? <laughs> Um, how can it help you to study for the AP exam? Well, these things that are really important, having adequate sleep, um, getting exercise, keeping your body healthy, having long-term long -term goals and daily goals, um, having a growth mindset, realizing that you have the ability to um, learn. Everything isn't based on sort of, uh, you know, some in innate ability that you might have, that if you put forth effort, you will be able to grow and learn all the principles that could be on the AP exam and all, everything you need to know. Um, and you also have to prioritize relationships. So how can the testing effect and active processing help on the AP exam? Well, what is the testing effect? Well, this is the idea that enhanced memory occurs as a result of retrieving rather than rereading material. Don't just read your textbook over and over again. Read it, test yourself, ask someone to quiz you, make up your own quizzes, you know, make up flashcards and have somebody else test you. Those kind of things can be really helpful. Also, the idea of active processing. Enhanced memory occurs with intentional engagement with the material. Put materials in your own words. Summarize passages. Use mnemonic devices. Any way you can actively process the information rather than just being a passive recipient of the information. Connecting it to prior knowledge is also connecting it to other things that you know about. Actively think about the material that you're learning. 
The SQ3R method is a pretty popular method known to help with um, studying. So the S stands for survey, scanning the headings and note the module organization within your textbook. Uh, question, attempt to answer the questions posed by learning targets, the ones that we're posing at the, at the beginning of every module. Find out what you do and do not know before you read. So you could think about, hmm, I'm gonna look through this book and, and say, this module and say, hmm, I know a little bit about the idea of cognitive neuroscience, but I, have, I don't really understand such and such. And then as you are reading through it, think about how you can connect what you already know to what you're trying to learn. So the next steps in the SQ3R method are read, actively read, searching for answers, ask more questions, take notes, retrieve, test yourself, use the testing effect to your advantage so you can check your understanding. Sometimes we think we understand stuff until it comes to the test and then we're like, wait, I didn't really understand that completely. So really practicing, retrieving it and testing yourself over and over again as you're studying is really effective. So the final step, steps of the SQ3R method are review, reread your notes, pay attention to the organization, write or say something, write or say what it, something is before you reread it. Uh, use the module review, and their textbook has so many wonderful things and ways to be able to study for the AP exam. Complete practice questions, use the unit review sections for key terms um, and, and the key contributors, and really practice all the questions and, uh, and material that are available to you. So how can psychology, going a little bit further with how principles of psychology can really help you to study or on the AP exam, this is one of the most fundamental things, fundamental ideas, concepts within the field of human learning is the idea of the space, the spacing effect. It's sometimes called distributed practice over mass practice. So basically, if you study um, for four hours all at one time, or if you study for one hour a day for, for four days in advance, as in this example, it is likely that the, the distributed or space practice will lead to better outcomes on the exam for you. So using space practice and distributing your study over several different sessions leads to better long-term retention than cramming or mass practice. So how else can psychology help? Well, we'll use the concept of interleaving um, and break up your time studying psychology with the study of other subjects. Don't just only study one subject at a time. Um, research has shown that long-term retention is actually increased if you interleave different subjects that you're learning it, um, with each other. So think critically as you study and question assumptions and potential biases. Process the information actively. Activate your prior knowledge. Think about how it might apply to something in your life or in your other classes. Overlearning. As you study and continue to practice, sometimes, as I said earlier, we think we understand stuff. Um, but we probably don't understand it to the level that we need to. So this concept of overlearning and continuing to practice is really important. So how can um, the textbook actually help you? Well, Dr. David Myers created a nice little video that I'm going to show you. Hi, I'm David Myers, psychology author and Hope College psychology professor. I'm here to help you learn how to make things memorable so that you can learn and remember more from your classes and perhaps get better grades as well. You might want to pull out something to write or type on because the first thing you need to learn about learning is that the more actively you process and rehearse information, the better you will retain it. Let me ask you, were you ever told that the best way to prepare for a test is to reread the chapter over and again, that the purpose of tests is simply to assess what you've learned, that you should study but one topic at a time in the same place for lengthy periods? If so, and if you believe these things, do you find yourself struggling to remember all those new concepts in your courses? Well, don't despair. There are more effective ways to learn. Here are some strategies that, if put to work in your own studies, will help you better retain what you're learning. The big idea, which has now been confirmed in lots of experiments by memory researchers like Henry Rodiger and Mark McDaniel, is this. To cement new learning in your mind, what helps more than rereading is repeated self-testing and rehearsal of what you've learned. The memory researchers call this the testing effect. We also sometimes call it the retrieval practice effect or test-enhanced learning. So for example, in one experiment, 
Jeffrey Carpenke and Henry Rodiger had students learn 40 Swahili words. Some of them kept restudying the words. Others retained those words much better if instead they spent the time repeatedly testing themselves on the words. And so the principle here is that testing is not just a way to assess learning, it's also a way to improve learning. We learn and remember material best when we put it in our own words, when we rehearse it, and then retrieve it. And that's the testing effect. And it's a phenomenon that I built into my text through the SQ3R study method. SQ3R refers to its five steps. S for survey, Q for question, and then the three R's. Read, retrieve, review. So, the study a chapter, first survey, take a bird's eye view, scan the headings, notice the chapter organization. Next question, before you read each main section, try to answer the learning objective question I posed at the beginning. You probably won't be able to answer, but that's fine. Trying and failing to retrieve the answer is actually quite helpful to learning. Those who test their understanding before they read and discover what they don't know often learn better. Next, read. Actively search for the question's answer. Read actively and critically. Ask questions, take notes, make the ideas your own. Ask how they relate to your life. Then, having read, retrieve the main ideas. Periodically pause in your reading and rehearse what you've just read. Ask yourself. Yes, test yourself repeatedly. To help you do this, in my books, I offer periodic retrieval practice opportunities throughout each chapter. With each one of these, you can rehearse what you've learned and you can check your answers and reread as needed. If you struggle a bit, that's fine. A certain level of difficulty or challenge is desirable. It's better than questions that are too easy for you or impossibly hard. And then finally, the last R, review. Read over the chapter organization and your notes. Also, one other thing, it really helps if you distribute your study time. Don't cram. If you want to remember for five minutes, well, you can just repeat something over and over. But if you want to remember for five months or five years, then study and test yourself off and on every week or so. Space out your study time. Do it in different places. Okay, well, let's put the testing effect to work. You might want to pause and ask yourself, what is the testing effect? And how does it work? The testing effect is the fact that recalling the answer, what we call retrieval practice, boosts memory. For example, at test time. And let me ask you another question. What are the steps of SQ3R? Do you remember? The SQ3R steps are survey, question, read, retrieve, review. So, in summary, test, test, test. Take advantage of self-testing and self-checking opportunities. Second, be active in your learning. Put things in your own words. Connect new ideas with important things in your life. Third, distribute your study time. Space study leads to much better retention than does cramming. Now I know, I know, some people learn and remember more easily than others, just as some people naturally are faster or stronger. But for all of us, muscles grow stronger with exercise and so do our mental muscles. Thus, the good news is that test-enhanced learning is one way in which you can strengthen your memory muscles. Now, uh, just ask yourself one last time, what is the testing effect? That was a great overview of some things that can really help you in this class and in many other classes. So let me get back to our slides here. Okay. We are now to the last, uh, the last few slides, the review, uh, putting Dr. Meyer's learning principles uh, into use by reviewing sort of our beginning learning targets from the, from the very beginning of this module. So if you remember, the first one was, Describe how contemporary psychology focuses on cognition, biology, and experience, culture and gender, and human flourishing. Well, the nature-nurture issue helps us explain behavior. Darwin's natural selection led to evolutionary and the biological perspective on behavior. Um, attitudes and behaviors may vary by gender or culture, but overall we are definitely more similar than different. And positive psychology, promotes the idea of human flourishing and is a very popular field within psychology right now. Learning target number two, 
describe the biopsychosocial approach and psychology's main perspectives. Well, that approach integrates biological, psychological, and sociocultural viewpoints. Um, and it's something, again, it's sort of the, one of the most prominent perspectives when we're thinking about psychology, modern contemporary psychology. Psychology's main perspectives, we're gonna be focused on these throughout the course, are behavioral, biological, cognitive, evolutionary, humanistic, psychodynamic, and sociocultural. And finally, our last chart, learning target was explain how psychological principles can help you learn, remember, thrive, and do better on the AP exam. <laughs> well, Dr. Myers just did an excellent job of um, visually describing some of these learning principles that can really help you in this class and in all your other classes. The testing effect is one he describes in detail, shows that we remember more when we practice retrieval. So when you're reading through your textbook, Make sure that you're testing yourself, just not reading and rereading, go, going through and giving yourself little mini exams. And these don't have to be formal things, just come up with ways to test yourself. And of course, doing all the testing at the end of the chapter and throughout the chapter is very helpful. The SQ3R method that he described can definitely help you learn and remember. There are four important study tips. The first one is essential, distribute your study time, that distributed versus mass practice, no cramming. Learn to think critically about things, process your class information actively as you're listening to what I'm saying or reading the slides or within your textbook, try to think about it and connect it to other information and overlearn. Even if you think you already know something, spend a little more time learning it. Spend a little more time testing yourself on it, getting other people to test you, that kind of thing. And flourishing it's important to take care of yourself to be able to perform really well in your classes and whatever you want to learn um, you need to get enough sleep and exercise um, have a growth mindset and uh, form relationships that will help you develop as a learner okay thank you for listening to module number two take care